Welcome to the second episode of the Long Term Wealth with Passive Income podcast. I'm Gabriel Griffin, and this is Crawford Liner. He was one of the first clients I had several years ago. I thought that it would be great to bring him on and just talk about sort of the, some of the things that he was going through back at that time, how we worked together to put him in a different situation, and then some of the stuff he's working on now. Um, he was able to get into real estate a little bit, interested in uh, starting perhaps his own business, things like that. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So how's your day going, Crawford? How are things happening? What's going on? It's going great. It's nice and beautiful out today. It's nice and warm, which has been great. So I'm, I'm, yeah, it's definitely a good day. How's yours going? I'm good, man. You know, r- right now I'm dealing with a lot of stuff. Like uh, I'm having to evict a couple of tenants because of lease breaking actions they're doing. And it's uh, all expensive, but it's fine. You know, just can't have them, can't have them there right now because it's just they're trying to destroy the place. Some of them, so, yeah. Anyway, um, one of the first things I wanted to ask you is, like, how did you make the decision at that time, all those years ago, to uh, to kind of look for some help? And then what were some of the things you did, aside from talking just to me, but in general, what, what were some of the things you were, you were trying to do back at that, at that time? I'll give a little background into that. So I met you on one of those summer trips for UNCG back in 2019, I believe it was. And you were telling me about all the things you were doing with GIS, and that's geographic information systems, how we were kind of trying to go down the same path. You had already done it through the military, and you were doing you know, top secret work at the time. And I was trying to get into grad school because I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time related to GIS, because I, I didn't know what paths were around or you know, what options I could take to you know, benefit myself and my career. One of the options that you mentioned was to potentially do the military or just flat out apply to these places that were offering top secret clearances for work. You know, I, I didn't really listen at the time because I thought, you know, grad school will help me open my own mind to a couple of things and I will, you know, I'll find my own path. And then after grad school, I ended up working in, working for a private company that did electric scooters, um, which, you know, Maybe it wasn't the best idea, but it was all I had at the time. I, went, I worked there for maybe two months, and then I got laid off. The company was a startup company, so the, the owner wasn't doing his due diligence for his employees, and a lot of people lost their jobs because of it. You were talking about, like, because you were really, you were excited about the job, and there was, because it was a startup, there seemed like there was a lot of upward mobility. You seemed, from what I remember, to be, like, a little more intelligent, not intelligent so much as just more capable than a lot of the people that you were kind of meeting at that time, maybe. And then I remember when you first started thinking, like, I don't think he's running it right. And then not long after that, I think you mentioned that he was that the company went the company went bankrupt, right? Yeah. Well, they got bought out by some some other company in Canada, and then I kind of just cut off contact with them after a while. After I'd lost my job, I. You know, I I didn't really know what to do, and I kept thinking about what you were saying before, but I was maybe, maybe I was a little bit too prideful in how I was handling the whole situation. Um, Not, you know, losing your job is is very demeaning in a way because it makes you feel like you you know you're not you're not good enough or something went wrong, and maybe it was not your fault. But for me, I was taking it personally because you know I just felt like I wasn't good enough, and maybe I. Maybe I did do something wrong. Now, I remember that we worked a lot with your mindset at the beginning. That when we actually did start working together, that we we talked a lot about mindset, how to frame challenges so that they're not problems. You know, a lot of people when they look at the difficulties they they have in front of them, they they see a lot of problems, which kind of can make it look like a thicket, and they stop. But um, you know, we talked for hours about each one of those things and sort of moving them moving them from the problem to the challenge. That way, there can be a solution for it. Yeah, I remember that. Correct. And then what happened? You know, after a while, I was still living in Mount Pleasant because uh, that's where I moved. I moved to uh, Charleston uh, for that job, and I was living with a girlfriend at the time. And it was everything just kind of seemed like it was collapsing in on myself. You know, right after I lost that job, like we like it didn't work out, and I ended up leaving, moving back home with my parents, and I was just you know unemployed for a few months and. I was 22. Pretty young, yeah. That job paid decently well, right? Especially for North Carolina, I think. 
it was one hundred percent a mind game. You know, like you, you really you can't see where your life is going when you're. For me, when I was unemployed, I, I couldn't see where anything was going. I didn't really know who to talk to. I didn't know who to ask advice from because, I mean, my parents are super knowledgeable and you know they they have the experience that can help with maybe people skills and talking to people, but who who could they really point me to that would help me with GIS questions with with the specific ones on like who to apply for how to apply for them how to write the correct resume for these positions how to interview properly what what questions to ask what buzzwords all these all these things that need to be in your head when you're going in for interviews and sending emails to people that's the unfortunate part schools don't teach you how to how to set up all of that it's all essentially marketing you know you have to be able to frame your skills in a way that the people who need them can interpret it correctly. And I don't think that that's, no one's taught how to do that. They just sort of guess. And then some people are lucky enough to fall into internships, which is a recommendation I always make. I think I told, I told you about that when you were uh, in grad school, I was like, you should definitely consider, I always tell, I always tell people to do that. Always consider internships because you know, you really need three things. You can only, you can be successful with only one of them, but three things are helpful to, to really ensure that you'll be successful. And that's like the experience, the connections, and the education that you have. And so oftentimes right. people think that, oh, I have this bachelor's degree or even I have this master's, but they spent the last six years really only getting one of those. And so they have no connections in the industry that they want to be a part of, and, um, and they have no experience in the industry that they want to be a part of. So for people who are in that situ situation, is like college people and things like that, always do the internship because that adds that experience into there. And then if you have, and then if you're able, once you have the experience, if you're not just gonna be by yourself, then you'll also have connections. And that's how you start building out this network of support. And so I've been doing that since I was probably 18 or 19 years old. So when it comes to helping people, especially in the STEM fields, it's very easy. With any type of engineering, industrial, aerospace, electrical, mechanical, and then also in the sciences field as well, I'm able to really construct them properly to be able to um, move pretty quickly into a job. And so that's kind of kind of leads us to maybe the next question I have for you is when we actually did start working together, because it was a couple months into into you not having a job at that time, and I think that you had sent out a lot of applications, right? Yeah. And then I think that at that time, no one just no one responded except for like one or two people. The way that it would really go would, would I was using what you recommended, which was USA Jobs, and then just you know using whatever company websites were available for those specific people that I wanted to work for, and I would get responses back most of the time. I would I would get back with recruiters, and they would do the the good old fashioned government screening process, you know, where where the recruiter just asks questions, lifts it off a piece of paper, and sees if you fill out fill out the numbers correctly for the most part but you know it, it wouldn't really go much past that maybe sometimes i would talk with the specific manager that i would be working under or with and you know we would talk about whatever and the job specifically for the most part my experience with the field and everything like that and you know, for the most part, I felt like I was doing totally fine, but I'd either make, I'd either be like the runner up behind somebody or just not really recognized at all for these positions. You know, whenever you see the same thing happening over and over and over again, for me, it becomes kind of a, a place to look. So I knew that for you, it dealt more with the interview process, probably not so much the resume, but I remember taking a look at it and, and providing you a bunch of critiques on that but I think for you I really focused more on it seems like your your deck wasn't loaded so to speak you didn't have enough to make you the number one but you had enough to get you pretty close and so that's why we started talking about all the different options so I remember at that time I had you on maybe four or five different options the first one which you were very interested in and I actually could have made it completely through was that military option where you would have become a geospatial um, analyst right just within what was it like maybe two or three months and then an additional like six months of training and then very low obligation but kind of a big commitment but you were interested in it after that it was corporate work which I told you was harder because 
you know, you have a lot of people with a lot of experience in the corporate world, and um, it can be hard when you have so many veterans in the mix, and you have a lot of affirmative action plans in the world, or at least in, in the U.S. It's, it can be hard to beat all that out as a young 22-year-old without a, a lot of experience. Um, but that's why, that, and that was my assumption that you keep getting close. So then, what I said was, okay, if we add if you had continued with the military part of it, if we add that with, with maybe a USA job working for either the, the local government, the state, or the federal government, then we can put we can use that first and then transition you back to corporate work, which is higher paying. And so we had created this like, what was it? I think it was like a four year long, I you know created it with you, this four year long strategy where, um, where you would start in either the military or the federal government or the state or the local government and then you would transition back to a higher paying job um, later, later if you even, even, even wanted to, because one of the things I had described was that with federal work, state or local, it's very consistent and long term, whereas with a company that has to maintain certain revenue and profit margins, for example, like with a startup, it, it, it's less, it's more tenuous, you know, so. That's correct. And then we started working, and, um, and I was sort of just with you there every step of the way, and then you were able to eventually become, not long after we started working together, about uh, 60 days, two, two months, you were hired as the geospatial information officer for all of Fort Eustis. Yeah, that was, you know, pretty amazing. I think you were making, well, I want to say, 63 or 70. I went in as a GS, GS-11 uh, for the Hampton Roads area, um, which was 64 uh, even, I think, 64-ish around there. And that was pretty amazing, right? So GS-11, uh, you know, there's only 15, and most come in at a 7. Um, I've, I know people with their master's degrees that came in at a 7 and live in Washington, D.C. You were an 11 in Virginia, so that's, yeah. you know, and, then, and everything kind of changed at that point for you. Uh, things really kind of shot up, and um, yeah. and then you you kind of really excelled there. And I can't remember what caused you to want to leave, though. I think you just, I guess it was just that, that type of, it's what I described to you at the beginning. I was like, you're probably not going to, if you are a hard charger, you may not like bureaucracy. You know, there was, there was a lot of different deciding factors in the end. I really think that the big one was that, like you said, it was I was the GIO for all of a military base, but with that being said, there's no moving up after that. Like you get your step increases every year, you know, just if you you know work work hard enough and you you, you get the commendations that you would need to get the step increase. But to be clear, you were in the position of somebody who could easily have been in their thirties, forties, or fifties, right? Easily. Yes. Easily. You were, you, within 60 days, you went from not fully sure of what you could do with your life to being where mid-30s, 40-year-olds find themselves after enough hard work. That, that was awesome for you because of just how many things kind of fell into place, which opened up that position. But your feelers were everywhere. We had a really distributed attack process on for you and, and um, and that was the one where it was just clean and easy, straight through. Um, the, 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 the military liked you, right, I think. And then the resume was fine. And, oh, that particular one hinged on something people really need to consider about their own experience. Number one, you really never know who needs it. And so that's why you needed to find the blue water, is what we call it in the entertainment industry essentially where the sharks aren't, right? You need to find that story that hasn't been written, blah, blah, blah. So it's like you need to know who needs your skills but don't even know you exist. And that was that group, right, for the most part. Yeah, that was it. That really was it. It was it was interesting. Like right when I got there, I automatically felt like I, I was kind of a, a big shot, so to say, you know, because I was like maybe the only GIS person on base. And maybe some people knew what it was, but no one really – no one could really like assist with any projects I had or anything like that. No one really like had any input on the stuff that I was doing. You know, I kind of would just do my own thing and then produce whatever I made. And if they didn't like it, I would redo it. And if they did, then it was fine. Actually, I you know I still work for NASA, and we'll get to you in a second because I know you've had some pretty great um, career advancements as well. 
I just got offered a job myself within my company, moving up to a different position because of that exact thing. Uh, my background is incredibly unique in general. And then when you can, when you, when you include that, I already live in California, which has seen a lot of changes uh, with the space force and the space systems um, organizations coming in. And most people aren't aware, I bet, that there are so many space centers in California, or at least on the West Coast, that uh, when you need somebody with like a geospatial background that's dealt with certain like development labs and certain end user customers and the development of applications and the, and then when you get even lower and it's like ground systems for space, it's like I'm like I ended up being one of the only people in the country who could do the job. I got a call like maybe a week ago. Or I guess three days, like three days ago, and um, we'll see how that goes. I don't, I don't need to take it, but, but when someone comes to you and says, "You really have the thing that this one customer needs," you know, I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm always gonna take that call. When when you fit the role for a company that is basically willing to do whatever it takes, you, you can, you can definitely come out on top with with offers like that switching gears back is I wanted to ask you how did you feel during the process because I you know I want to, I want to hear how you feel honestly I could definitely say that while right when we first started I was still nervous and all around unsure and overwhelmed because I mean I, I was constantly putting pressure on myself that I have to get started right now I have to do stuff now like I'm, I'm running out of time I, I don't I need to be able to provide for myself and my future family whenever that comes around and you did an excellent job on basically telling me to just breathe. <laughs> you know, like it's it's totally fine. And you're 22, 23 now. Like you have tons of time. So and you're doing the right thing by by taking your anxiety and the stress and putting it into, you know, the process is what you kept calling it. You kept calling it the process, uh, which was just sending resumes out all the time, constantly being on people's in on people's desks who are hiring for these positions. And then, you know, over time when I was, when I was getting more and more interviews and more callbacks. So. With the callbacks, one of the things that I think interviewers, interviewees need to know is that when a hiring manager is talking to you and they're asking questions, those aren't just random questions. You know, as a young person, you can, you can think, oh, this is a position, they called me in, I wanna talk about my experience. But what you really have to do is half of it is like your experience, half of the, the other half of it is listening to what they're asking and then talking less about the things they're not talking about and talking more about what they are interested in. And what happens is you start to fill this gap of like what they want, right? Instead of talking about all the things you were, you start talk the conversation over the minutes, you end up talking about everything they need and how you can provide it. A very subtle but important interview technique is to be listening to what they, what they need. That's all a job is. It's filling a need. So if you're, really, if, if you're focused on what you've done in the past and how you're the perfect person for the role, all of that might be distracting um, because you, you have to remember that you're trying to fill a need. And so once we talked about that, I think you and I had meetings every step of the way every level up once we really started working together we met and and strategized prior to that particular interview i needed to know everything that happened in the last one so that way we could position for the next one and i needed to know who that person was and more, and about their organization right i would ask you questions like okay well who was the first guy what department was he in or she in and what did they do and then above them it's like okay they moved you let's just make something up random from you know to electrical systems. Okay, well that clearly there's a need in electrical systems for your experience. You wouldn't have seen that coming. That's the bullseye. We need to do well in that space. And then you might move to somewhere else and then you get hired. But if you if you're not thinking like that, the company and the hiring managers, it's not just one, oftentimes there's multiple and they're moving you to where they think you might be the best fit and you have to perform well in that space. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but you were saying um, how you felt during the process. We were going through it at the beginning, and it was just really unsure. I was just really unsure for the most part. And then kind of over time, after I started getting a little bit more comfortable with the interviewing 
and you know responding professionally to higher ups for whatever company and position I was applying for, and you know constant advice from you on what to say. You know, I, I was getting a little bit more secured, and I felt a little bit more safe in that. You know, I, I started to realize that well, I'm making progress in in what I'm doing with you right now. When before I was just kind of hoping for the best, and, and now I'm actually seeing re- results, and I'm, I'm I can I can still go back and see all these emails that I got during that whole process, and you know, I saved plenty of them, thinking that maybe I could give them a call back in the future if whatever I'm trying to do right now doesn't work. You know, there was just a bunch of options and stuff like that. Yeah, so you were, I think right when we ended, you were talking about, it was a little self-doubt as we worked through the process, but. Yeah, yeah, I was, so that was at the beginning, you know, I I was feeling a little um, unsure about things. And then, you know, over time, it, it started to feel a little bit more comfortable. I was more confident in myself. And you were constantly reassuring that I was doing the right thing. You know, I had support from my parents as well and family and other friends all saying that I was, seemed to think I was doing my, trying my hardest and I knew I was trying my hardest. Um, And then it ended up working out really well. Good. You know, I I got a fantastic career position and yeah, I I mean, it's honestly kind of surreal how it all happened so quickly, honestly, because like you said, it only took about 60 days, maybe even less. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, you know, one, another thing I wanted to talk to you about are some of the decisions you made as we moved through the process. So, you know, I work, the way I work is you know, I will come up with normally three to four courses of action for you, right? We talked about the private sector. We even talked about the military and everything that they provide. And then we talked about, uh, you know, corporate timelines versus government timelines and so forth. And I really laid those plans out for you to choose, hey, this is what you have. You could enact your plan and get yourself where you want to be in you know, six months to eight months. You could get yourself where you want to be within the next two years. And then some options are maybe never going to happen. Maybe they could happen. But you know, in, it's all about how much risk you want to take on the front end and the timeline that you're okay with and then you know, where you want to end up on the back end. And so what I really wanted to ask you is what are some of the decisions you made that got you kind of to where you are right now? Yeah, I remember you saying that the fastest was the military, and then, like you said, those other ones took a little longer, and I was going to do the military. I was having both, I was talking with Fort Eustis and trying to join the military at the same time, Uh, and I was just going to pick whatever one came about first. I remember that. And then they they both came through, like, almost at the same time. Yeah, and I love when that happens, and I had spoken about the military. You know, not every job in the military is on the front lines, right? There's hundreds of jobs in the military. Many of them are designed, as we talked about, to just support the members on the front line, the people who are deciding, you know, where a, a bomb might drop or like actually force on force contact and that type of stuff. But you have so many more things, the people who deal with all of the supply lines, the people who deal with the logistics, the people who deal with the information operations and the civilians and the consulates and the ambassadors. And you just have so many other things going on all at once. A lot of people don't think about that. Yes, everybody goes to basic training and everybody's sort of trained to the same level, the same standard. But, you know, there's so many specialties within uh, the military. I know people who work in the nuclear field, in finance, in human resources. And all of these people are getting certificate or even, you know, uh, uh, cybersecurity. All these people are getting certifications that could be worth tens of thousands, maybe even a hundred thousand dollars on the outside if we're talking about like security clearances and things like that. And they get you the ability to be able to take advantage of jobs that people on the normal civilian side would have to work so hard to do on their own. They'd have to take out loans or they'd have to, you know, which is I consider a bit more risky because you're the one having to pay for it without being sure that you're going to get a job at the end. But anyway, the military does all that for you and supports you, but not only does it give you the certifications and the education and the training you need, but it goes a step further and you already have the job. And then when you get out, there's all of these, or even before you get out, if you were in the National Guard or the Reserves, you have all of these organizations that are designed to just land you a job in that field because they already know you're trained, they know that you have a certain standard and work ethic most likely about yourself, and it's just an easy, easy win, an easy sell. So that option 
is always available and it's always on the table um, depending on the branch and your age and different things like that and we talked about all that stuff and a lot of people just normally aren't aware about all that and another is immigration you know I own a few companies and one of them is starting to do business internationally and we're bringing on people from other countries and so now I'm working through the US immigration process and there is an option within the military where you're able to go directly to being a citizen within a few years as long as you know you have a certain amount of time left on your visa and so for individuals that are interested in working for me, that was an option on the table if they were interested in fast tracking themselves for you know, the process to become a citizen here. But there's other things as well, other visa types that you know, a company can hire or the ways to become a citizen before you can become hired by a company. But anyway, the, you know, so the military even has options within that realm that a lot of people don't know about but that you can take advantage of. As always, I talk about why choose one option when you really don't know what's gonna happen at the end. You should choose multiple options and then whichever one, whichever one's come back and is the best, go with that one, right? Because you wanna make sure that you're happy, that you're making enough money, that you're working with people that you like because it's much an interview for them as it is for you. Uh, you wanna make sure that, like I said, that you're happy that you're not gonna just leave the job after six months because you hate your boss or you hate the work or you hate the location. All those things need to be in order and we had talked about that um, in, in your process as well. And so, and so one of the things, and, and you know, that kind of rolls into the next question I have for you, which is like, you know, what did you find to be the biggest value in the process as we got you from you know, point A to point B? Learning, learning how to listen, I think, is 100% something that I will take with me for the rest of my life that I learned working with you and going through the whole process. I see it here in Charlotte all the time. I see people who I, like we go out with I go out with my friends and I can just point people out who are way too arrogant. I can tell that they could be better and they could be in a better position, but they don't listen to the people who know more than them. And it's it's incredibly frustrating. It happens with my friends all the time and I know it happened with me when we first started. You know, I it's it's hard. That's right. I remember that and it's one of the most important aspects you know, of this process is just being able to listen to the advice that people are giving you who have been there before, who have yeah. worked through that, who have the experience. Yeah, I mean, because like, like, let's be honest, like taking advice from someone who's like the same age or maybe three years older than you is, to some people that's really like, almost demeaning in a way because they feel like they, they should be there because they do the same amount of work or they at least they think they do. They, they think that they do the exact same amount of work and process power to get to these positions and it's just not how it works especially in the in the stuff that we do like you have to take advice from people from anybody who's been in that field for longer than you because they know more and they, it's just hands down they know more and if you take that advice you get into the spots that benefit you yeah and you know as you as you know I've worked in you know over seven different industries and I've been watching how these top organizations operate and then I started my own company and whether it's the military or you know, the top level of engineering or whether it's sales and marketing and all of these different areas that, that kind of come into business areas I've been a part of I've taken all that into the, the company that I own and I've interviewed hundreds of applicants for multiple different positions within my own company as well as also on the part of other companies you know I had a senior position there and it's just if you don't have all of the knowledge that it takes to thrive in those high-paced environments or to even start your own company and really manage it at a top level, then you should be the person thinking about how to listen, how to find someone, how to find a company, a course, whatever it is, to, with people that are knowledgeable to get on the right track to get yourself where you want to be, whether it's in a higher paying career or if it's to take your knowledge and move yourself to the next level and not work for someone else. Um, if you have a skill set, you want to mature your own skill set while also covering the other business areas that you have to to really be successful in your market space or in the market space that you want to be in. They could be doing so much more and there's so much potential everywhere. Right. Yeah, and you know, that is part of it as well. But, you know, like even if even if you do feel like you're excelling in a field that maybe isn't, you know, working for NASA or working with Space Force or something like that, or... Maybe it's just like, you know, maybe it's a little bit smaller than that. Like you can still, there's always going to be more potential and room for growth. You know, as you said, yeah, the biggest value is listening. And I agree with you. And that 
seems to be the hardest part for people. And, you know, I recognized I had that skill set pretty early on, somewhere around maybe the age of like, I guess, 21, 22, because uh, I started my career pretty early, around like 19. And then, you know, I took all the notes I could. I watched the seniors do their thing. And I took all that in and then with my master's in business administration and all the case studies I looked at with, you know, the top companies, Microsoft and Google and Amazon and so on, and how they changed with the times and all these different things. I took all that in and use it in my own company. Um, and I know that a lot of young people, many are doing very well, they're pushing hard for what they want, but I see a lot more that don't know what they want, or at least they know they want more, but they're not sure how to get it. And so you know, my recommendation to them is listen to the advice from people that, that know what they're talking about, the people with high net worths, the people who own companies, the people, they, you know, in this business, I, in, or in business, I see a lot of people in the world kind of say, he's lucky, you know, but then when you talk to that guy, or you see an interview, he talks about working 16 to 18 hours a day with four hours of sleep, and, you know, 20 years later, people think he's lucky, and, you know, you probably know who I'm talking about, but um, anyway, because, you know, sometimes when people know exactly what they want, they are so focused that they realize that they're they don't realize they don't realize it, but they're in the same pool as every, as a hundred thousand other people, you know, trying to get that job or that position. You know, sometimes what you have to do is kind of flip it on its head and determine where their skill set is wanted by the industry, and oftentimes that's in a place that they don't even know exists. And so I have a method of finding that which we work through exactly, and just you're able to show them the degree is the same and the skills you need are the same, but the job title is different. And you, it, finding who needs your skill set is what will get you paid the top dollar. Um, and sometimes it's not so obvious. And, and, you know, and besides that, anything else that you're thinking about when it comes to uh, the biggest value? Besides listening, yeah, I mean, I don't know, listening just stands out so well in my mind just because of how ours went. You know, it, it's interesting. I would say almost every client I have says that. I'd say that that's their biggest takeaway from this process is that if you listen to what I'm saying, then you will get further. Because that's why you came to me in the first place. And so if you're not willing to do the work, um, because that's the one thing I can't do for you, I can't sit in the interview for you. I can tell you what you should do about your resume, but ultimately that's your decision. There's all these different things that are really your choice. Um, and so you just have to know that coming in. And you might do things that you didn't expect. You might get options you didn't expect, but that's what you should be looking for. Uh, that way you move your, yourself forward faster because this world is full of unknowns and what you're trying to do is find a path to get to success. And sometimes, and for many people, that can be both anxiety filling and also a process that they're not fully sure about how to get from A to B. You know, and success looks differently for everyone. I had one client who all they wanted to do was just parachute off buildings and airplanes. That's what they wanted to do. Whatever makes you happy. You know, and that's what success felt like to them. Yeah, I mean, I guess happiness is really what you want in the end. And if that's what makes you happy, then go all out for it. And with that, I do wonder, where are you now? I know that you were able to uh, buy property. You're now where you want to be. I know things are going well with your girlfriend. And so can you kind of give us a little idea of how things are going for you in general? Where am I now? Well, I'm in my condo now. Uh, like you said, I, I did. And good job on that. I was able to buy it after spending a year at Fort Eustis. How much did it cost? It was 185. That was the final price that we settled on. That's good, man. How old were you when you bought it? I'm. I was 25 when I bought it, and I'm still 25. And then you know, 26 on on Monday. Nice. What's the uh, return on investment on that right now? What's the equity appreciation? Oh man, it's got at least doubled by now. It, I, I've I've looked up some other places that are around here, and they're through the roof, upwards of like three three twenty, give or take. And I, I just got extremely lucky with this place. Yeah, and you know, it's not even really that lucky because Charlotte, North Carolina right now is one of the fastest growing cities in all of America. Whenever I do these, uh, you know, small little TikTok videos or Instagram videos, I sometimes get asked like, okay, what's the fastest growing city? Or I'll do research and I'll see them all as they change. Charlotte's always on the list, at least for the past few years. It really is. It really is. Yeah, Charlotte is always growing. Uh, all the places that are relatively close to uptown are ridiculously expensive and people are just paying whatever they want. They'll just throw down however much the guy's offering or more than. Like There are no like low ball offers or anything like that. People just pay cash for these really beautiful houses or condos and then 
move from wherever. And it's just, it's only going up. And then what are you doing now with the job? I am a GIS analyst for Gen X Systems, which is a subcontractor for NASA Langley and now NASA Johnson Space Center. I support the Johnson Space Center team as their lead GIS analyst. Basically what that means is we are in the process of doing all their support GIS services. So anything that relates to mission completion, any kind of GIS support, GIS editing, editing tickets, requests, all that kind of stuff, as well as creating a whole new architecture for their GIS system falls under us. It's, it's mostly just looking at maps that I've made and then, you know, editing whatever's on them, specifically utilities, building floor plans, footprints, work orders, d dig permits, you name it. Anything that's on center relating to GIS, we have a hand in it. You know, one thing that's very important in this process is just understanding where your skill set is valuable. You know, some skill sets exist at every level of government, whether you're talking about the state, local, federal government. It's also maybe replicated in the private sector. And within the private sector, maybe there's also different functions that operate the same within like the Department of Defense or the Air Force or the Marine Corps. And every single one of them has a different a list of requirements for what they need you to know. And maybe one offers only 45000 but then you're the local county government area. But then if you're doing the federal government, maybe you're a contractor and they're, they're offering 100 Or maybe you're a, an actual government employee and you're making 77 Or whatever it is, you just, it's very, it's to understand the job market as a whole when you're going into this, this type of work, whatever you're doing, is really important. The, where all the places it's needed are. You know, if you just go on, and how to find them, find them. if you just go on Monster or Indeed or, or just Google search it, you know, that might not be enough to really get a full understanding of the broad picture and why it's needed and how to communicate to that specific organization. These are the types of things that um, if you understand, your, your ability to get a job increases dramatically. A lot of people don't know why they're not working. Minor changes here and there get us further. You know, just, they just push us further ahead of the group, you know, one step at a time. Right. You're right. Yeah. You know, and when you're in and when you're in college, you're not really thinking about, you know, I'm going to go for this specific niche in this specific market. Yeah. You kind of are being made to become a generalist if you're even sure of exactly what you want to do. Biology is so general, but even what we do, I mean, I'm not, with my background it, within environmental science, we are one subsection within that entire institution of knowledge. You know, if but when I began my college career, I had done that work prior to even choosing the degree path. So I knew that the option I chose, which has the same general skills as all the other subsections of environmental science, had made the most money. And so I knew that my median income, when I went into the negotiating table, I knew the number to say, which happened to be higher than the median because why not? Especially since I had already been doing the work to increase my I would say quality of my overall marketing, my overall presentation of my skill set uh, to the potential buyer, which is you know the company. So by the time I get out of college, I've had maybe what was it two years of experience working in the government as well as in companies, and then I had already been in the military. I had training, I had a, you know clearances, and all these different things. So when I packaged them together, I came in well above the margin that one would typically expect for that position with the number of years of experience that I had and then you know leveled up pretty quick from there because then the company is offering I chose a good company that offered the right bonuses the right packages where you know paying for additional training schooling certifications and so on and so I was very smart from the beginning about how to work through the process and so when I take on a client that's kind of one of the things I look at how many of those things have you done for yourself what can we add in the timeline you're looking for and then where can we put you to make the most money that you can and if you're not, you can do that for yourself if you have the knowledge. And if you can't, then you could, you know, message my organization or you could build that knowledge within yourself. You have options there too. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, to add on that, like you, you were, you were at UNCG and you went through the geography department. They, they really only made it seem like you, you could only do like physical geography relating to geomorphology, geology, right? The, you know, the stuff with the earth and more sciency, or you could do urban planning which, I mean, speaks for itself, or GIS. And I, you know, going through that whole process made me realize that, you know, GIS is intertwined in all of that, but they never seem to really 
hit on that too much. So there's always going to be potential for, in my case and in our case, GIS like can be implemented into all of those and honestly should be. But you could kind of take that knowledge and do it with, with whatever field you're in. Like every, every field is going to require some sort of thing that you want to do for the most part. For the most part, yeah. And you, and you know what? The people at your university, while I'm sure they're very learned, they're very highly educated people, your professors, they may never have actually worked a job, or at least they haven't worked in the field or where you want to be. So what they're teaching you will probably come a lot from their own experience, um, or at least from their studies. And so it does take a, a different skill set to really be successful, I think, especially in the private sector. Whether it's you know, real estate and it's the you know, high-rise building next to you with the penthouse for a million dollars, you know, that the work to get that place even set up started with probably a GIS planner. Yep. Right, right. You know, started with probably also real estate developers who had the money, but they are interacting with the city, the local GIS office. Within that office are GIS planners, people who work with urban planning as well as zoning and, you know, the actual GIS analysts and all those people working their own jobs to get the plans approved or maybe they're a part of the process or whatever it is, it's entwined in, even in that. You know, and it goes like beyond that as well. So, you know, there's a lot of people who are interested in being in law enforcement or cops. And so right now I have a security service that comes around on my properties. A lot of those individuals in the, within the security world are actually off-duty cops. And so if you're trying to make connections to, say, the local police department or the local police departments or the sheriff's office or whatever, becoming a part of a security company or the right security company, getting kind of introduced to the people who work there, you may actually become introduced to people who work within the police departments. And I'm sure that wouldn't hurt uh, if you're trying to actually apply for a job there, right? And you're one of 60 candidates in a rotation or whatever it is they're doing. Yeah. So it's just... That's a part of the process as well. It's not just education. It's also making sure that you are engrossed in the, the connections and networking properly. Uh, being where you want to be, also getting the right education, and then also the experience. And so, you know, working with a security firm is a good way to get experience doing portions of the job that you'll do when you actually do go into the schoolhouse. You know? Anyway, that's just a way that when you, if you change your mindset and change your thinking with this process of trying to get where you want to be, and you kind of think about those three variables where, you know, whether it's connections, experience, or education, and making sure that you're doing efforts to push yourself forward in each one. That is a big part of the process I, that when, I, when I'm working with the client, making sure that they're kind of covering their bases amongst those three variables as well. It's literally just finding whatever you want to do and then fitting that into a specific niche for a company that looks good. Yeah, if you can find that, then I mean, you're basically set, and then you just have to apply yourself. Yeah, and you know that's that's it's important to to really consider that stuff when you're trying to get where you want to be. You know, a lot of people think they're going to spend a hundred thousand dollars on a degree, and I'm going to be good. No, and that's just not true anymore, or at least it is not true for a lot of people. It can be maybe if you go to an Ivy League school, or if you get, become a part of a fraternity, and then you just kind of have connections that some people do well, and then they bring you into their company, and they can it can happen in a very more a much more organic and natural way but if you do it with that in mind then it's just far more formulaic and you're more likely to have that input get the output you're looking for as opposed to it being more of an accident yeah and then so another thing i wanted to ask you are, you know what are some of your future goals you mentioned to me your company like why do you want to start it you know if there's anything holding you back what what's that you know so definitely for goals i want to be able to lead a team for this company that i'm working for right now the way it is set up right now is we have a team of analysts, which is what I'm a part of, and then we have the lead lead analyst that kind of sees over all of them but still does the same amount of work that we do. And he's based in Langley. For quick steps forward, I would like to take that position. And, you know, there may or may not be talks relating to trying to take on another space center in the right. future for a different contract. I would definitely like to take, like, a whole team, hire one, and then do their work for them. And then just take over a whole other space center and be the head person for them. I think that's a good direction that the company should take. And I know that I could definitely do it. And that would be something that I would really want to do within the next five years, maybe a little bit longer, depending on logistics. But that's, that's definitely an end goal for me right now. 
Yeah, and I'm sure it's helpful that you were already a GS-11 for the government. You know, one, that means a lot, like we talked about. That means a lot if you do decide to do that and then move into the private sector, that is a very respected part of a resume. When a contractor or a person who works for the private sector company has worked or has been the customer, has been on, the, on that side of the house, um, because you bring all that experience to them, and that's experience that many of them might not have because they, they took a different path to that company. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you were, uh, what was it, like a captain? In I believe it's a captain. That, right. Yeah, and you know, the funny thing is that the company that I work for right now has definitely taken that into account. They, they, give, me, they give me some tasks where they kind of ask me to delegate it to other people and then quote-unquote manage it. So they've given me interns before, too, that I've had to basically just manage. And, you know, I've, I've tried to teach them, you know, as much as I know about the, the process, as we keep calling it. And you know how how they can fit their skills and their as they say never do anything that you're good at for free. No, of course not. I, I mean, you'll 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 get a check pretty soon. <laughs> so, but yeah, you know it, it's cool because it seems like the company actually is listening to what I want to do, and you know, I've made it clear where I want to be in the next couple of years, and I'm having my yearly progress report, uh, the the big formal one here in in June, in about a over a month now. So. That'll be interesting. Definitely would like to maybe see a pay increase. Uh, maybe you could do Airbnb. Airbnb? Because you have like a three-bedroom um, condo, right? No, I, I mean, I have the one bedroom here, and then I turn the other one into just like a little sitting area, and then I have the office over there. So, I mean, yeah, honestly. That's a good idea. Who doesn't need a sitting room? It is. It is. I'm telling you. I was going to film in there, but you said no. Don't do that. You can read in there. You know, who needs an extra $3,500? You can look out the window and see the parking lot. That's right. A place to go and sit. Yeah, it's beautiful. But, you know, it's funny you bring that up. I was thinking about for next steps relating to just personal life would be to buy a second place. Good. For rent and rent it out or Airbnb, you know, whichever one seems to be better. Yeah, that, that just requires a little bit more research, but... Yeah, yeah, and so for the you know for the Airbnbs that I own, I'm doing minimum thirty day stays, and it's really set up for you to be able to come in and just do your thing, you know, if you're traveling or whatever. I have like minimum minimum level of impact on there, and I hired a real estate assistant to really take care of the rest of it for me. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty profitable profitable business right now. I'm working on pushing my occupancy rate like as high as I can. That's the goal. Very nice. Yeah, because I mean, it's it goes back to the whole listening thing. Like you've been basically begging me to do it for a while now. And it's just a waste of money. Why not? It's easy. You could make twelve hundred bucks a room, probably extra a month. So I mean, it works. I, I watch it work for you. So I, I definitely wouldn't would like to do it too. Honestly, the good part about it is you don't have to work for it, right? This is a system that's designed to just make you money, and you own the space. You're able to get the real estate. You're able to use your job to get the real estate to then create a passive income business, a passive income structure. And that's what my whole business is designed to help every individual that I work with do. Wherever you are, that's the path. If you like the sound of it, that's the path I try to put you on. You know, right now, I just turned 28 not long ago. And if I wanted to, I could likely retire. Jeez. But I want at least two before this becomes my 100% focus or my 80% focus. That's the goal. And I feel like that's pretty great. That's what you want. You know, I don't have to care about the stock market. I don't have to care really about, because everything I'm doing, I have one monthly payment, the mortgage, which includes you know, taxes, insurance, and the mortgage payment. And then I planned for a certain ROI from the very beginning. And then I optimize for that ROI monthly, which Airbnb allows you to do, but pretty much nothing else um, that I can think of right now, other than like maybe other vacation stays. But that's concept in general is what allows for that kind of constant optimization of your income structure so it's, it's pretty great and then also you know creating other avenues for your money to sit and grow you know whether it's investments or whatever and i know you've been investing yeah yeah i've been investing since undergrad i've been on top of that for a while that's correct yeah that that's really how i was able to buy this place was just starting early that's that's how it was done yeah and so I, you know i wanted to ask you do you have any tips for other people that are listening you know and it doesn't have to be anything about stem in particular yeah, just listen to the people who know more. I, I can't stress it enough, and I know we've talked about it already, but please just listen to the people who know what they're talking about. You know, like you have a goal that you want to get to. Everybody who's gotten to where they are now has had some help along the way, whether it's financial, emotional, 
you know, any, anything, phys- like physical help, like anything. That's true. Coaches, physical coaches. Just listen to the people who know more. Because if you want to get to these goals, you can't. You can do it alone, but wouldn't you want to make it easier and faster? I know I would. That's how I see it. And just don't. And you know, there's some people who don't, right? They want to take the long path, and I've had clients that did. That's on them. You're right. Yeah, there are some people who don't, and that's a whole pride thing. And you know, if they do it, great for them. But I mean, for me, I I knew I needed help. Another thing, just thinking about back to that time, like just don't don't take it so personally. It's it's so easy to kind of just sit there and be like, man, I'm not good enough to get these positions. I'm not where I need to be, and I, I maybe I just chose the whole wrong path. That's really not it. That's some of the first things we work on. A lot of the clients, they just they don't believe they can, and so they never try. And so we have to oftentimes deal with that first. And then once we get through that, then we can get to the work. Everyone in the world that has a position that's good, that they like, they got there some way, and you can too. So that's kind of very important to, to get to work through. And I know we, we dealt with that, especially at the beginning as well. You can 100% make it with whatever you're doing now, as long as it's constant, constant work towards that goal, you will make it. Yeah. And in terms of working with me, you know, why would you recommend that? I feel like right when I first met you, we were already pretty close friends and we, we had just met. You know, you're really good at understanding people's emotions and then you're really good at assessing situations and where people are. And I, you know, that was kind of one of the things I was a little bit worried about when I first started working with you was that you, you really didn't know what I would want or you wouldn't really listen to what I want. But it seemed like I was the only one talking when we were working together and I was just telling you and you were just sitting there and you were listening and then you came up with the whole plan on what to do and it worked very quickly. That's what I do. I I really pay attention to you. I listen to what you're saying and I try to assess where you are, where you want to be, and then provide you the options to get there. Concrete options that are very realistic for your particular temperament, your specific goals, your life needs, all of those complex sort of just things that need to be taken care of for you. And so I, you know, I try to become that conduit that really allows you to achieve all those things. And, you know, and sometimes the decisions people are making are very dissimilar from what they need to make to get to where they've been talking about. Yeah. And so there's a deconstructing of the decision matrix that they have within themselves that they've sort of grown over time that come from their upbringing or whatever it is to make that decision making process more focused on their goal and working with you to get through that. Because if you don't change how you make decisions, you will not change your life. That oftentimes is the beginning because you can't really do the work until after that. And and I cannot work with you until your decision-making processes are the best that they can be to get you where you want to be. There's no such thing as perfect, but they do need to be at a certain level to be excellent anyway. You know, And even for people who know what they want, sometimes you might need to break open that egg just a little bit to just ask some questions because the thing they want might only make $45,000. But if their goal ultimately is to be financially free individual, that might not be the thing they need to be to get them where they want to be. And so you have to be able to pose those questions to clients to be able to like, do you want to only make $45,000 as the median for 20 years of work or whatever it is? If that if that's okay with you, you need to understand that your goal is not realistic. You need to diminish your expectations because of the life you're choosing. But if you want more, you need to increase your expectations for yourself, change your decision-making processes to align with that, and then we can begin the work, or you can as well, you know. Yeah, and you know, even with your, there were other things at play. You know, you had been rejected by the corporate positions, making it to the final interview, and then just one person just had enough to get past you. You know, and that kept happening again and again. But then with the military, your specific skill set is so unique that there was no one else who could fill it, and they wanted you now. If you, if we had not done a multi-pronged approach, then you never would have gotten that position, which has set you up to now work for, you know, NASA and all these other things, um, which was a part of the long-term plan from the beginning. Yeah, it does get really specific when it comes to that, but you're right. There, there are always going to be, there's always most likely a better opportunity than what you are willing to settle for. We don't, we don't really like to settle around here. We, we go for the big ones. Yes, we do go for the big ones. Yeah, and you had also talked about starting your own consultancy. I feel like I'm still relatively new to this position right now, and maybe maybe I will or maybe I won't. It, it, we just kind of have to see where things go, uh, especially after this yearly review. I think we'll, I'll have a better idea of what I want to do. But I have I do cons- 
consider it, you know, roughly on, around like a weekly basis. I try to think about more logistical stuff, like what would I, what would I really, really be doing and would I be happy doing it? Would this be something that I'd be proud of? I, I have worked out some of the basics for stuff like that, but, you know, I always end up uh, kind of forgetting about it, get lost in other things. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I always say do everything it takes to start the business but don't start it, right? If you're, if everything works out, if all the plans, if all the money, if every, if everything's what you hoped it would be before you started at the end, then you sure start the business and keep moving forward. But if it doesn't work out, you can take those life skills that you learned as you delved deeper and peered behind the curtain of all these different industries you'd have to interact with that you didn't know about before as a part of that discovery, you can choose to step away or you can choose to jump in. Yeah. And um, that's how I've started a lot of businesses. You know, each one, I was pushed to start because I had already client. I already had clients. I already had you know intellectual property that I could market or sell or whatever it was. I already had skills that were in demand, and so when it came to starting the business, it was more as a necessity because the protection from liability or whatever or, or the process taxes properly and income and blah blah blah. I had to do it now. Otherwise, I I, re I recommend to people to hold off on that until they actually have to do it and just do the discovery of what it takes to do it and learn everything you can because at the end you might choose not to and then you get to take all those life experiences into the next potential business venture until you're ready to go all in and invest in something you know you'll enjoy, you know you understand, and you can just move forward that way. Yeah, and you know, it's completely free to do this as well. You know, that's the beauty of discovery. That doesn't cost any money. It's just a Google search and maybe it might cost your only time. And if you want to be financially free and you want to do it soon or you want it to not take the rest of your life, I think that time is well spent personally. And, you know, and time is one of the most important aspects of that process because if you're not giving yourself the time to learn, you're really doing yourself a disservice. Time is one of the most important, I mean, it really is the most important thing in life. It's the only thing you have and it's the most valuable. So if you always think, I don't need to know this in, for another six months, you're completely deleting six months of time where you could have built up knowledge. You know, when I started buying properties, I had been thinking about it since I was 15. So by the time I was 25, you know, I had 10 years of knowledge. People ask me, how did I know this stuff? My level of knowledge is so deep. How did you know it? How did you find it? How did you do this? It's like, well, I might be only 25, but I've been doing this 10 years. And so you want to give yourself as much time as you can to make decisions because that is so important. It is really what will could make the difference. You know, right prior to buying the property I did buy, I was involved in an investment that was okay. But because I have a process and because I always follow it, I found a second investment property, went for it. And I'm for sure it was a much better return. And I was able to optimize strategies that had, I had thought were correct for five or six years in, you know, within a month or two of deciding not to go for one and to go for another. Right. I optimized a strategy I had held for many years. But there's no way I would have ever been able to do that if I had not been deeply invested in the thing I wanted to do for so long. And so, you know, in the last minute here, I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming, uh, for talking about your story, for explaining, you know, how you felt to work with me. And I look forward to seeing your journey and you grow and the decisions you make over time. You know, this has been a partnership that I've enjoyed for years now, and I'm sure there's many more years to come. It's great to see your journey and you, you know, I guess doubling your net worth every year and working for NASA is really just great to see. And you can find us at WCCSLA on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, and our website at www.wccsla.com, and our podcast on every major streaming platform. Thank you so much for coming, and see you all next time.